for the future for a people-centered, uh, bottom-up, and impactful internet governance. Um, the goal of this particular session today is to is for us to provide additional perspectives in relation to the future of the internet um, as a contribution for the Global Digital Compact, uh, with a particular focus on two of the themes two of the issues that the Global Digital Compact is looking at, um, the gender and environmental sustainability. And for that, um, I'm very pleased to have with me a panel of the partners that are, um, have got together to collaborate around uh, putting together these contributions for the Global Digital Compact. So Derechos Digitales from Latin America, uh, APNIC and Dot .Asia in, for the Asia region, and Kiktanet and Policy for Africa. Uh, together with the Association for Progressive Communications. So we are going to have three parts in this session. The initial part is going to uh, provide an um, input, a contribution, as a provocation for the conversation uh, around the two main uh, focus for the session, which is gender and envi environmental sustainability. We are going to be having Gaia Trikandadai and Esmita V uh, providing those inputs. And then the second part is going to be around regional priorities. So we will have the partners bringing the regional input to the conversation. And then the last part will um, be a final remarks with some of the concluding aspects with my colleague Paula Martins. In the, in, in, in the we will also have the opportunity to, to bring your input questions and comments uh, during the session. So welcome once again, and um, I would like to start with uh, Gayatri Kandadai. She's the head of technology and human rights from the Business and Human Rights Resource Center. Um, Gaia will join us remotely, and Gaia would uh, tackle the environmental sustainability issues and the tech corporation responsibilities in relation to this issue and how that should be played out in terms of having a people-centered, sustainable internet um, digital future. So Gaia, welcome and um, happy to hear your contribution. Yes. Thank you, Valeria. It's fantastic to see you and, and Smita again. In addition to being at the Resource Center now, it's not very long ago that I was still with ATC and, and, and with colleagues, so it's always great to come back to these conversations. Um, could you please confirm if I'm audible enough and is my speaking safe slow enough for the captioners? Should I take sort of a yes? Yes, can yes. you hear me? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Please. All right. So um, my role, what I'd like to do is in the next few minutes, um, frame two broad issues around the environmental sustainability uh, debate and uh, ask really around uh, tech companies. Uh, the first aspect I would do is, is to frame around um, environmental aspects. And second, around regulatory, uh, regulatory developments that seem somewhat positive, but but requires a lot of lot more advocacy uh, at the moment. So that's that's basically how my intervention would look like. Um, as far as tech companies and the environmental impacts of tech companies go, um, before we get into the conversation around environment, we have to look at it in the broader context of the fact that overall corporate accountability in and from the tech sector has been a very hard ask. It's been a very difficult uh, sort of journey in terms of pushing tech companies to realize and accept the fact that they function in a system where they are they do have responsibilities, more specifically the responsibility to respect our rights um, and in ethical terms to refrain from causing further harm. Um, well, obviously it's hard to say cause no harm because the significant harm that they've already caused. So at the moment, the ask really is to is to get them to halt the harm that they're causing and, and not further, uh, or at least that's my pessimistic view at the moment. Um, when it comes to the environmental impact of tech companies, it really is across the life cycle of tech companies, and I'm talking about all kinds of tech companies and, and, and not just privately owned tech companies, but also partially state owned companies, but also fully state owned infrastructure relating to tech. Um, 
overall there has been throughout the life cycle of all of these entities significant environmental cost uh, when we're talking about at the infrastructure level the amount of land that's taken up amount of uh, metals that go into setting up the infrastructure the damage that's being caused to marine life uh, and the oceans in the process of of uh, the speed at which we're trying to connect so i think at that stage there is that and at the hardware stage of course there is very little that needs to be said in terms of precious metals that need the, the intensive need for precious metals especially with electronic vehicles and 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 the and the technology that goes into electronic vehicles at the hardware stage there's a lot of physical and environmental damage that we're seeing in terms of the extraction and the extraction of water oil all of that that, that goes into this and then when we move into the use stage of technology and i'm talking about the user interface the user experience of technology the amount of energy and the carbon footprint that the tech industry is causing not only by its own operations but also in terms of the business model that they subscribe to um the tech industry's obsession with optimization with the uh, profitization and and um profiteering to the last minute uh, of sort of move fast and break quick approach that the tech industry has um that is causing us to connect uh, more to interact more to do more which all of which has a significant energy cost and a carbon footprint cost as, as all of you might know and then when we move on to the third phase and i'm broadly categorizing it as as you know the pre pre user phase user phase and post user phase at the third phase it's a question of disposal of of the different um uses that technology has the technology industry consumes in a way so the e waste that's being generated but it's not only e waste um the kind of culture in tech companies of not necessarily paying attention to the environmental cost to the kind of operations that they have um the kind of energy consumption that their officers have um that also leads to a lot of other kinds of waste being generated and especially the name of recreation and making workers comfortable in most big tech companies there's a lot of waste that gets generated that's beyond e waste um so these different phases we are seeing significant harm that tech use and tech companies are causing now unfortunately i would say that a lot of focus that at least from what i've observed has been more about how consumers can mitigate this how consumers can lower the environmental cost of course consumers have a role to play but the problem here really is that tech companies and even governments the current way in which we talk about technology the current obsession with doing more of this tech are being more online spending more um time on different platforms especially platforms like TikTok and YouTube unfortunately it means that it's difficult for consumers to pull back because the culture that's being pushed is so diametrically opposite to that ask um and when it comes to addressing tech companies responsibilities around their energy use their environmental impact on even broadly uh, the question of environmental impact and tech the platforms that are available for us to have this conversation are unfortunately limited because most digital rights spaces are grappling with the level of digital rights abuses that we are not able to get fast to delve deeper into the the larger systemic issues around gender around environment around race all of these these are and digital rights spaces sometimes are also not necessarily tailored and suited for having specific environmental conversation so the digital rights spaces are limited in that sense because the expertise that needs to be in that space the actors who need to be in that space to make the change are not necessarily there and then if we move to the traditional business and human rights spaces and i just got back this morning from the UN forum on business and human rights there were several conversations around environmental impact of companies environmental sustainability but there was literally no conversation about this particular sector a sector that's causing so much harm a lot of the conversations in the business and human rights platforms and spaces have been tailored or are targeting 
for the lack of a better word, traditional industries like mining, oil, those industries are the ones. Even health industry gets uh, quite a bit of attention. But in the business and human rights platforms, spaces, the working groups, tech industry is not specifically talked about. There could be many reasons for it, one of which is that digital rights groups are also not very active in those spaces because obviously our plate is full and we, we, we're currently dealing with different priorities and different our, our resources are stretched thin. And then there's a third kind of uh, uh, platform, which is the environment-focused platforms, the sustainable development-focused platforms. That's true. Unfortunately, technology does not have that much of a significance because the amount of work that has gone into the visibility, into getting visibility for other industries is still in the making for the tech sector. So for digital rights groups and environmental groups, there's a lot of work that needs to still take place for surfacing tech and um, environmental issues into these policy making platforms and to the larger awareness raising issues. I'd like to move to the last bit of my intervention, which is around uh, a specific um, development, uh, like regulatory development that's currently ongoing, which is the EU Due Diligence Directive on uh, on a mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence directive. It's it's called the CS3D, Corporate Star Sustainability Due Diligence Directive. Um, last week, over 75 uh, digital rights organizations signed on to a joint statement asking for the due diligence directive to be strengthened, especially in its application to the tech sector. And I'm just sharing that link in the chat. Several members who signed that are, are, are members and partners of APC's own network. Give me just one second, I'm just sharing that link here. Um, at the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, we did an analysis uh, about the directive in its current form, uh, looking at it from a tech perspective. The impact of tech companies on people and planets is something that is getting mentioned in this directive. There are promising provisions, particularly relating to the environment, climate change, but the overall sense um, and feedback we received from groups is that it is not as strong or it doesn't sound as mandatory, especially the climate change aspects of it are not as, does do not sound as mandatory as the human rights obligations that the directive is pushing. So which also means that the directive that is like, that is currently being developed in the EU, like all other ICT regulations will have an impact on other jurisdictions. Um, we are currently looking at a policy that is being developed in Japan, which went through a comment uh, phase and it's likely to get finalized um, in the next few months, which is similar to the EU due diligence directive, uh, which mentions environment, which includes tech companies as a positive um, outcome from the, the Japan process. But we are going to see more regulation across the globe. Um, the U.S. was the first uh, jurisdiction where recycling and e-waste disposal uh, regulations were brought in. Most recently in India, there is discussions ongoing about developing a law or regulation or policy. We don't know what it exactly is going to look like, which talks about standardization of charges, e-waste e dealing. We don't yet know what the scope of that policy is going to look like. So in the global south, there are multiple developments as far as regulation is concerned on environment and tech industry, due diligence and tech industry, human rights and environmental due diligence on the tech industry. There are going to be newer um, developments that are going to come up, which means that this is also a moment for us to mobilize, organize, have a very clear thinking around what is going to be our ask. Um, how how these regulations should look like, and then comes the battle of how tech companies are going to embrace these regulations. What are going to be the consequences for tech companies if they don't? Um, ideally, how we'd like these uh, due diligence uh, initiatives to look like within tech companies. Um, what I would overall say is that uh, this is these pieces of regulation, especially the environmental and human rights due diligence pieces, are very important because it is the starting steps 
it allows it it requires companies to do an analysis before the harm is done so that they can prevent and mitigate the harm the problem really has been in terms of getting tech companies to know and then also show that they understand the harms that they that their operations are likely to cause what is one of the key challenges with these regulations around um human rights and environmental due diligence has been the fact that the value chains of tech companies are a little bit different from the value chains of traditional sectors so so, so to speak traditional sectors in the sense that for tech companies it's not only the supply chain that matters actually the downstream aspects of the tech companies in terms of how they move their products how they move their services how they dispose of the products how they dispose of the waste that they generate that is extremely critical um the eu council has come out with its position paper uh, i think it was late yesterday or midday yesterday um there are some uh, disappointments no doubt uh, but for the environment it still looks like um, it looks okay the council's position looks pretty much the same around the environment but, uh, but several sectors to be left out so i think all of these are things that we have to be alert to and it requires a lot more mobilization a lot more conversations and articulation from different ways of looking at it um looking at it from a digital rights perspective looking at it from an environmental justice perspective looking at it from a feminist perspective looking at it from a corporate accountability perspective sustainable development perspective it's it's going to require a lot of work which also means that it needs to become a priority um in the middle of all other priorities that we have at the moment thank you yes thank you gaia definitely um, unpacking the particularities of the value chain of the tech corporation is a priority in the time ahead in terms of understanding the the, the impact and how the regulatory and um the regulatory and legal uh, developments um can respond to those challenges and the implications for the different jurisdictions so thank you so much for bringing all those issues for us and putting on the table those important elements for the conversation so next i would like to invite my colleague esmita v from the apc's uh, women's rights program who is going to um, share a perspective on uh, what is needed to build a gender responsive digital future if we want internet governance to really incorporate and to address and to respond to the gender dimension of internet governance and, and the gender dimension of uh, digital technology. So welcome, Smitan. I don't know if this is going to work. Yeah, it's I too far. It's you want to sit yeah, here? I think that's I keep playing musical chairs in all my sessions. Um, hi, good morning. Thank you for having me here. Um, and I think um, I'm, I'm really glad Gaia spoke first because um, I think another thing which we need to increasingly pay attention to is very much environment and earth justice um, within the technology spaces. Um, I want to talk about gender in how do you, you know, before going into gender just internet governance spaces, I want to start by talking about what does a gender just internet look like for us, right? What does it mean to have technologies which are gen gender just? Um, and why are we speaking about this, right? Um, the reason why I think this is relevant to speak about, as I said in um, another session, is that in the opening ceremony of this IGF, women and LGBTQ persons were mentioned once in all of 90 minutes, right? There was one black woman speaker. Um, this is a problem, right? And this is also really shows um, what are we thinking about when we talk about gender, and how is it is it really seen as important in these spaces um, for women, LGBTQ persons, and persons of like diverse gender identities and marginalized uh, locations? The internet is increasingly becoming a difficult space. Uh, and this is because of the current socio-political conditions, because of the authoritarian governments in different countries. Um, the civic space where they can speak up freely is shrinking rapidly. Um, this uh, it, it, It's because of surveillance and censorship is one, which is at a systemic level, but there is also a very big reason, which is like online gender-based violence, which is targeted at women and queer people who are vocal online, especially if they're vocal against the ruling government in a country, against like, 
dominant religious norms in the country or are just like you know just speaking and existing right um, and this is not unique to the internet and that is something we need to remember because these power structures which are there in the internet today are very much offline power structures which are getting translated onto the internet and online spaces which means you know a patriarchal society would of course be patriarchal online as well they are not going to change just because you are online um, if anything it becomes worse um, you know uh, homophobia which is offline is also reflected online same with racism casteism all the power structures which are in the offline spaces which move up online and one of the spaces where we can talk about this are policy spaces like internet governance forums um, at the global regional and national levels but these spaces are not accessible they are not accessible for women they are not accessible for lgbtq persons they are restrictive actively restrictive in terms of um, you know how many women are in the room how many gender diverse persons are on, in the room um, and and you know it's it's a places where these uh, conferences are held accessible in terms of visa in terms of safety in terms of language and accessibility right um the reason why i keep saying gender diverse women and gender diverse again and again be is because we get stuck in this idea that gender is just a binary that we are gender inclusive if we talk about women if we have more women in the room it's not gender is a spectrum it's a universe there are thousands of gender identities um to start with we can start with like a few at the very least but we if we get stuck in the binary of man or woman um it will be very difficult to include people later and we should know this best because um you know it has been very difficult to bring in women into spaces which were largely white male dominated um especially men from up uh, global north countries um english speaking men cis gender heterosexual men so if it has been difficult to bring women if we wait to then bring in gender diverse persons to bring in trans persons and queer people we'll keep waiting right um and another reason to talk about like to break the binary in uh, how we understand gender in policy spaces is also because policies love boxes they love putting us in boxes they love making laws which give you a guideline on who 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 the law applies to where does it apply to but policies need to be fluid if we are really going to ad understand and recognize that people are fluid people are multiple things at the same time you know i'm not just a woman i'm an indian woman i am a queer person um you know i'm a non binary person i'm a dalit person i'm all of these things at the same time and if the policy is going to looking is going to look at only one version of me the policy is never going to address all the rights that i have or need in any space right um in terms of accessibility and particularly because this igf's uh, key theme is building a resilient internet which is sustainable and shared um it's very important that we talk about women and lgbtq persons in uh emerging technologies that are coming up right now and and whatever regulation that we are planning around these emerging technologies increasingly camera cc sorry so slow sorry yeah um increasingly um you know there is more and more governments which are implementing um facial recognition softwares mm -hmm. algorithms um you know increasing a uh, different sorts of surveillance technologies to govern the people to <laughs> govern the people um but it's actually to control the people right um when these technologies in themselves are very problematic they again once again uh, throw certain marginalized identities under the bus once again right um for example if uh, facial recognition is being used as evidence in a judicial process um it's a problem because facial recognition in itself is inherently racist it does not recognize women it does not recognize it has a literal 0% um success rate in identifying trans and gender diverse identities um and it recognizes black women very very badly and it constantly confuses them with other people now if you're using this as an as a evidence or proof in case of a judicial system um it's a problem if you're going to use this mechanism as a way to ensure security in a space and you will not let in others who don't match who you know this computer is not saying are right um it's a problem it's going to become increasingly restrictive um accessibility is another element when we need to talk and and the reason i'm bringing in all of these other identities and 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 locations and um you know issues is because i don't think it's right to talk about gender as only like about gender as women as sex mm -hmm. you right because women are not just women they are black women they are queer women they are disabled women they are trans persons they are all of this and gender has to be read in an intersectional way it has to be read more broadly than just you know man and women 
and we need to start now because it's already late to be very honest um in terms of accessibility um you know um i'm i'm really happy to see that um igf spaces and you know national and regional igf spaces are increasingly accessible for persons with disabilities um which is a really good thing there are there are glitches and things to be worked out but that is always there the good thing is that we are thinking about it actively language is still a very big barrier in who is in this room when we are talking about it um the internet is more widely available um in india i can very confidently say even without like knowing the exact numbers that majority of the users who use the internet are not english speakers right um if they want to talk about the problems that they face online there is no space for it there's no language for it how do they learn about this right they go to uh, youtube uh, you know youtube is huge in many countries if and and i'm really glad that igf's videos are on youtube but they are in english and they are in un languages and un languages are not majority of the people in the world um and that is a big problem right um and i also want to um talk about like <laughs> the security because when we talk about policy one of the things that is constantly coming up is security right um in when we are coming into igf spaces we have to show our um, national id or our passport which has names which we we may not want genders which may we not want um to get admission into the space but in name of security who are you throwing under the bus again right people who don't look the part like they are supposed to be at igf people who um you know um 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 uh, look like they don't belong here and and that's how it's read and this is not just and this is like it starts with like people who are gender non conforming who um don't fit the boxes of how man and woman should look but also other people people who are dressed differently who may be heavily tattooed all of these things are part of the uh, a continuum um one of the biggest things that is needed for a gender just um internet and internet governance is that we really need to talk about internet shutdowns today because internet shutdowns are um one of the biggest ways in which people are shut down people's access is cut off and it disproportionately affects women and lgbtq persons in different places and um it's it's happening like you know right now 7 million people don't have proper internet access in kashmir 6 million people don't have access in tigray um palestinians are constantly censored in their um you know in in their expression online not just palestinians anyone talking about palestine is immediately shadow banned and stopped um from talking about it more right these are problems um if we want to talk about a gender just internet it should include women and queer people living in all these spaces as well and more right um and finally i would just want to say that i think decolonizing internet and internet governance is really important but colonial power structures are not the only power structures that we need to dismantle there are a lot of power structures which exist in each of our countries which need to be addressed and we cannot hide behind decolonizing alone and um i also know that i mean this is something that i've heard in this igf as well where um speakers and people said that oh we don't want to get political here you know we want to remain neutral your choice to remain neutral is political you cannot be apolitical when you're talking about people and internet governance is ultimately about the people and if it is not about the people they will just remain like words in the cloud pun intended um and yeah that's all i will end there thank you very much Sorry. Thank you, Sumitra. Thank you. It's definitely around people, and people, and 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 other beings in the planet. So thank you for reminding uh, us for that. Uh, for the sake of time, we will move quickly to the multi-stakeholder panel, which we are going to be hearing regional perspectives around those two issues, the, these two angles of the digital future, gender and environmental sustainability. And uh, I want to invite Juan Carlos Lara from Derechos Digitales Latin America. Um, he's the executive director of Derechos Digitales, and Derechos Digitales is also a convener of the LAC IGF. So Juan Carlos, happy to hear what the priorities in Latin America are in relation to these two issues. Thank you, Valeria, and thank you for the invitation to be a part of this panel. I have very little time, so I will go quickly through this uh, this intervention. Um, as Valeria said, uh, one of the conveners of the Latin America and the Caribbean IGF this year was the Derechos Digitales, along with APC and the multi-stakeholder committee in charge of that process. Um, and in that 
in that discussion, uh, the gender perspective was not one that uh, took a separate uh, discussion, but it was one that permeated the whole uh, transversally all of the sessions in that meeting. And from the priorities that were discussed uh, throughout those sessions and through thematic areas that were not about gender but also had gender dimensions, um, I will mention a few that are important. Uh, on the first hand is, is the idea that a digital future requires addressing gaps that affect gender intersectionally, including digital gender gaps uh, that be addressed from basic policy levels, including by facilitating access uh, for connectivity in the policy level uh, by facilitating how licenses, how spectrum is allocated, how universal service funds are allocated with gender and diversity perspective uh, to be integrated into those and to ease uh, how difficult it might be to have access to those funds. Uh, also from our work at Derechos Digitales, uh, with regards to connectivity and the participation of online governance spaces, uh, we have seen that uh, in those venues for decision making, including not just internet governance forums at the global and national and regional levels, but also uh, for participation in, in from even the lower levels of national policy up to uh, internet protocol uh, discussions with no sufficiently inclusive uh, avenues for participation. Also from the LAC IGF, um, two big problematic areas uh, were mentioned throughout the sessions. One has to do with gender-based violence as real violence with real consequences and concrete impacts on survivors' lives, and the need for sensible data handling of sensitive data, sensitive personal data, including that that is applicable to the gender identity of the people affected by this violence, where there is insufficient sensitivity by the state agents and by the state systems that should be reacting to this violence, which is uh, criminal in many cases. And secondly, and to finish on this point, uh, gender disinformation was also part of that discussion as a problem which requires an approach that is sensitive to the gaps, to the differences uh, in definition and impact, acknowledging that gender disinformation can either be seen as a subset or at least uh, a phenomenon which a huge overlap with gender-based violence uh, as a tech-facilitated phenomenon with real-world effects uh, and where the response should have interconnections in mind. Uh, very briefly on the environmental justice side, I wish to um, bring up the discussions that we had on this at a regional um, meeting last year. Uh, I will not assign names to that discussion because it was a closed door discussion virtually during the pandemic where some of the things highlighted were about dialogue between different sectors because, because in the Latin American region and also in the Caribbean I must say um, we see uh, many gaps where the cost of the digital development worldwide is, is basically paid it's basically burdened by uh, majority world countries where we see that uh, big data centers are located from Monterrey to Santiago in the south uh, overwhelmingly owned by U.S. companies, where extractivism and explo exploitation of natural resources happens throughout the region with some of the largest lithium and copper uh, reserves are in South America as well, where uh, energy demands from the connectivity is not sufficiently covered by cleaner energies and disposable devices uh, that are not recycled or repurposed basically become more sources of pollution uh, in uh, our countries as well. So all of this presents an environmental cost, again, burdened by our countries um, that, are, that is not sufficiently, that is not proportional to the benefits that are, are obtained by the digital economy. So through connection of different agendas, we could think about policies in different areas to integrate this, these perspectives into regulation, but we need an approach that also takes into account not just national concerns, but also regional and, and global ones uh, and the inequalities that uh, belie all under all of these problems. So thank you, Valeria. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Let me move quickly to Asia, and we have. A, I invite Jennifer. Jennifer Gretchen um, is um, the director of corporate knowledge at Dot Asia, and uh, happy to hear the the, the priorities uh, in Asia around these issues, Jennifer. 
Thank you, Valeria. Um, my name is Jennifer Chung. I'm actually uh, now I'm going to speak with the hat of um, Secretariat of the Asia Pacific Regional IGF because the Asia organization supports completely, uh, you know, the convening and also the, the logistics and the undertaking of, of the annual meeting in Asia Pacific. Uh, I want to touch first on the uh, the gender aspect uh, of our meeting. I think uh, this is the second year in a row that we've had a very high level speaker at the opening and closing plenary who is the digital minister of Taiwan, politically sensitive in our region for, for obvious reasons, and they are a, a, a non-binary person. Um, Audrey Tang is a very uh, prominent and very, very well-known digital minister. They are very knowledgeable, especially in the, the, the topics of e-waste and also gender-based violence online. And they have enacted uh, very interesting policies, especially in Taiwan, uh, to combat all of these informations. Um, in the agenda of, of the APRGF this year, We've only had uh, 18 very good uh, workshops, but a big portion of it was dedicated to to addressing accessibility for persons with disabilities. And I think that is more and more something that we've tried to include in our agenda setting, both from the, the first of the planning into the looking at the speakers, into looking at the content, to make sure we do include uh, diverse voices. And in those uh, sessions, of course, uh, gender has been uh, touched on in many, many different dimensions. Of course, the, the, the uh, gender-based violence, there was one uh, particular session I want to highlight is that uh, looking at uh, online has harassment really requires a lot of shift of paradigm of thinking because law enforcement, government, and also uh, um, civil society, of course, civil society is most uh, well, well known and, and, and understanding of these issues, but law enforcement in particular, when addressing these cases of online violence, need to have expertise in online gender based violence and to be able to correctly address uh, um, all these perpetrators and not have it turn into some form of victim blaming. That is a huge problem that we've seen. And unfortunately, I think there was a um, statistic that was pointing out uh, in, in one of the sessions where online misogyny and uh, violence has risen in an incredible amount during the pandemic because everybody's lives, work lives, social lives, everything has been shifted online. And the unfortunate matter of the thing is if you are able to hide behind some kind of anonymity online, you seem to kind of discharge responsibility in the words you put out there. And, and that is something that is unfortunate and needs to be addressed as well in a very holistic manner. Um, We've looked also uh, increasingly at the shrinking of civil spaces to be able to to be able to speak and to be able to advocate for different uh, um, priorities online. And then finally, I want to touch on the the environmental aspect. We had a very interesting session in in Asia Pacific this year talking about the carbon footprint of the internet and while we have noticed that you know of course there's a, the rise of people online and and the, the amount of time spent online does the carbon footprint of the internet really affects the the overall uh, percentage of carbon output of, of the countries and and it's interesting to note that even though the internet itself is a relatively clean a piece of technology, but it really does depend on the power grids that are in each jurisdiction. It, it, it depends very much on which the IXPs, uh, the power grids and the electricity use, if it's connected to a renewable source or if it's connected to a non-renewable source. So there was a pilot study that was done for six different jurisdictions in Asia Pacific and uh, hopefully this coming year there will be an expansion of 15 to 20 looking at the different dimensions from the, the efficiency of the internet from the economic aspect and also from the energy aspect so the the three different accesses would be able to uh, show and allow us to compare across the different jurisdictions to see how we can improve and going forward how we can take these findings to actually go to our different ministers of energy our different ministers of ICT to kind of uh, encourage them to to look into these things to green the internet and allow us to to maintain the sustainability of internet as a whole thank you thank you Jennifer please do share the link to the study I'm sure it's, it's going to be of great interest of the ones following the issue and let me now move to uh, the African region with uh, Barack Otieno from 
Kiktanet, the Kenyan Action ICT Network. Uh, so, uh, Barak, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'll follow suit and try and be brief. My name is Barak Otieno from the Kenya ICT Action Network. Um, currently, our tagline is uh, the power of communities. And um, we are doing a number of uh, initiatives, or we are engaged in a number of initiatives uh, aimed at uh, contributing to um, the subject that we are talking about. And I'll focus on uh, matters that touch on gender uh, and environmental issues. Uh, that, of course, are shaping how the Internet of the future should be like. Uh, I'll focus on three core or three key initiatives, and then I'll also touch on some principles, because I believe that one of the important outputs of this session is to come up with principles uh, that will help us um, shape or guide the Internet of the future. Um, we've been working uh, in the area of uh, community or of... Um, ensuring that um, um, more people in the communities are able to access the internet. And uh, we've had a project uh, with APC, the LockNet initiative, that has been championing community networks. Uh, what we are trying to do, and I think this is significant for the future, is to bring uh, the power of uh, the internet at community level. Communities should be able to design and uh, build infrastructure uh, that suits their needs and that addresses their issues at local uh, level. So more of a bottom-up uh, process uh, of ensuring that communities are involved in internet governance processes. Uh, may I also st state that um, the Kenya ICT Action Network has been convening the Kenya Internet Governance Forum. Uh, currently we are in our 17th edition mm -hmm. and um, we have focused on a range of issues from the year 2008 uh, starting off with um, uh, infrastructure issues uh, to current issues that are focusing more on uh, uh, on um, on the user or um, human-centered design issues such as AI as well as uh, uh, data protection issues to name but a few. Uh, and in the 17 years, we saw it fit uh, in 2016 to start the Kenya School of Internet Governance, and to date. We have trained over 300 participants uh, who are active practitioners in their own way, championing various aspects of the internet that have actually been discussed uh, by my, my by the previous panelists. And I think um, uh, the community networks initiative has been very significant uh, because we are seeing. Um, um, it's not only in Kenya, I'm aware that it's also taking place in the other African countries, uh, but it has brought to four issues that will be important pillars for the Internet of the future. And the first one that I would wish to uh, submit to uh, this gathering is uh, promoting digital literacy as a basic right, uh, because this is the first point that will ensure that there is inclusion from the ground up. More often than not, we have these conversations uh, in um, privileged environments such as the one we are in or uh, from the comfort of our capital cities, wherever we come from. Uh, but as the previous speakers had said, uh, there are many people in unserved and underserved areas who can barely afford to even have a conversation around internet because they can barely put food on the table. Who needs to be included in this conversation? Uh, the second issue that we have been doing, which will touch on the environment pillar, Again, Kicktonet has been working with partners uh, with the support of UK Aid on a digital accessibility program or digital accessibility initiative. Uh, to date, uh, over a thousand farmers have been trained on uh, different areas of digital literacy. And we know that uh, in most of our countries, uh, farmers are the ones who really um, engage with the soil. Uh, most of us who are from the cities um, the environment uh, is when we discuss the environment when we are talking about pollution of air and say noise uh, but when it comes to uh, say um, usage of soil uh, planting of crops or maintaining an ecosystem that actually guarantees a decent environment you find that it's the farmers who do this so Kiktanet has actually been training many farmers through the 
uh, digital accessibility program and this program is actually being scaled uh, throughout the country and I believe that um, uh, it is something that other uh, countries can be able to borrow from and uh, it leads me to uh, the second principle that I wish to promote uh, which is uh, promoting community centered design in addition to human centered design in tech development we can only be able to come up with solutions that are suitable for the community uh, by involving the community from the word go building their, their capacity to be able to appreciate uh, how technology can uh, be able to ensure that we are better at managing the environment and also better at addressing uh, gender related issues and uh, the last point that i wish to uh, also address uh, based on uh, the gender lenses again um, kicktonet with apc and other partners uh, have developed a digital inquiry kit uh, it's online uh, with the support of giz uh, it is an online tool and uh, currently as we speak in the last uh, three months or so uh, we've been on a nationwide initiative uh, starting with kenya uh, to just create awareness on online uh, gender-based violence um, this uh, course content is on a platform called atingi and i believe that it's accessible to the global audience and i believe it is a, a small way of ensuring that we create more awareness on gen online gender-based violence and we also give the power to community members to be able to address issues uh, that touch on uh, online uh, gender-based violence. As I conclude and as I touch on uh, the remaining principles that are, uh, I wish to propose for consideration, um, uh, again, there is need to focus on uh, uh, championing uh, for enabling legal and regulatory frameworks and uh, in our work, uh, whether it is with, uh, through the APC LockNet program or through the digital accessibility program, uh, one of the things we have been doing is to influence um, uh, the policy environment to make sure that there are supportive legal and regulatory frameworks that make sure that people can be able to access the internet afford, uh, uh, affordably and that also the internet locally is resilient. Towards this end, and again with the support of the partners that I have mentioned, uh, Kiktanet working with the Communications Authority of Kenya uh, ensured that uh, we developed a community networks license uh, in record time and currently uh, mm -hmm. our regulator again working with Kiktanet uh, um, and, um, uh, and other stakeholders is looking at ways of actually ensuring that there are more community networks in the country. Beyond the licensing framework we are looking at financing of community networks again uh, the issue of digital literacy is very key um, we are looking at uh, <coughs> uh, how together with other stakeholders we'll be able to raise resources that make sure that uh, digital literacy programs are conducted at community levels um, i would also like to mention that open infrastructure and accessible infrastructure is very key as we know uh, many times our infrastructure environments are vendor driven as opposed to solution oriented when we are talking about communities sometimes communities may not afford the technological solutions that have been devised by international operators and so it's important to con uh, consider uh, open solutions open licensing uh, to make sure that the marginalized are involved and last but not least uh, creating communities of practice is key sustainability can only be pegged on institutionalization i have had alternative uh, conversations that um, uh, we should be free uh, to do things the way we want but i think looking back um, uh, kicktonet i believe is uh, among the many initiatives uh, that uh, partners like apc have started from the word go and the reason we have been able to come this far and we are even having this conversation uh, is because we have built communities of practice that are now sustainable. I would wish to stop at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We are running out of time and I would like to give the opportunity to, to you all here in the case that you have questions and comments or reactions to what uh, you have heard from our speakers or also if you want to share any perspective in relation to both the responsibilities of the tech 
uh, corporations in relation to environmental impact or the gender considerations for a digital future. So the, 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 the floor is open for any one of you who might like to intervene. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I want to thank the panelists for their presentations. However, I just want to state that God created man and woman, and we can't run away from that. All the other considerations are man's creations. And in this digital space, we also have to note that countries have laws that they put in place. And in considering the freedoms over the internet, the laws in those countries must be respected to ensure that there is no violence and there is no computer misuse. So that is just what I wanted to state. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, please, there, there, and the, yes, please go ahead there, and first there, and then you. Go okay, ahead, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I'm Alan Kusuma from Indonesia, uh, SAFNAT, Southeast Asia Freedom of Expression Network. Uh, I just want to understand how are we going to be able, because one of the biggest use of internet is the social media platform, right? And then now we have a situation where Elon Musk is conquering the Twitter and then making so much ruckus uh, on Twitter itself. And it is affecting so many um, things, I guess, uh, especially when Indonesia has such a good use of Twitter uh, through the political uh, situation in our country. And uh, I would like to know how we uh, can intervene such situation because the thing with Elon Musk and Twitter, it shows that the digital, uh, that, the, that the platform itself is very fragile. The digital platform itself, the ecosystem itself is very fragile. When um, And I don't know how we can uh, intervene when people like Elon Musk is having such stage um, in the digital ecosystem itself, because I, I, I can see that it could be a precedent, especially uh, the ongoing conversation about Apple and Twitter um, uh, dynamic that they have just like two days or yesterdays. So, and I know that this is affecting um, because we we are at Safnet also uh, have a helpline to uh, to help the online gender-based violence victim, right? And when Elon Musk take the the throne at Twitter, uh, it it is very hard for us to communicate with the Twitter teams when we are trying to uh, escalate our reports on online gender-based violence and so on. So I, I would like to know maybe if we could have also this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let, let me take other question and then uh, get back to the panel for reactions um, and response. Yeah, I, I would like to just say that I'm quite uncomfortable with um, a religious statement getting involved in such conversations because when we look at religion and if we think of God we all have separate gods right we all have different religious perspectives and uh, well we are quite likely to see gender violence being justified in many religions and um, if you think there's a particular God that you believe in that created genders there are also people who don't fit into the binary um, female or male uh, system and if you believe in God, I think those people are created by your God as well, probably. So it might be a good time to maybe reconsider our language um, in terms of how we think about what we're going to respect and what we're going to prioritize and whether any particular um, belief is more important than people's actually experiences and eliminating violence. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to give the opportunity to the panel to react or to respond. So back to the panel, if anyone wants to respond. There is another question. Please go ahead. Um, thank you, um, our able panel, for the discussion. We are so grateful for whatever we are discussing today. 
that has to do with um, gender. Uh, I want to ask this question. What can we do to bridge the gap between gender and the, between male and female in the um, internet space? Then what can we do to build the capacity of females to deal with gender-based violence on the internet? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll give a go at the questions and I'll start with the first one on Twitter. Uh, for me, I think it's a great opportunity uh, which is uh, presenting itself as a challenge. Um, we can vote with our feet. Um, there's really no obligations to be on any particular platform and that's why I advocate for the power of community networks. We build our own infrastructure which we have control over because the problem with commercial entities is just that, it's commercial. When someone buys it, uh, Elon Musk can decide to shut it down today. Allow me to mention his name, uh, but in a positive way. If he decides to shut it down today or turn it into whatever he wishes, uh, I believe it's within his right in the jurisdiction where the organization is, um, is uh, located. And that's why we need open systems. Uh, that have no particular ownership and have no commercial uh, uh, backgrounds. And I think uh, with the work that we are doing with communities, uh, this is very possible to be able to do it. I'm sure there are many alternatives. Um, I know most of us who have been in technology for a while, we have moved across many companies that we cannot remember. So nothing is permanent in the world of technology. On the issue of uh, 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 the last speaker has asked, uh, I wish to point a few facts that uh, I had included in my notes, uh, there needs to be deliberate effort. I have seen telcos uh, in mm -hmm. my country, Kenya, where I come from, um, uh, support women enterprises that are in technology. And I think uh, it's worked really well, uh, because not to say that, um, uh, and uh, forgive me if I may use the wrong words, uh, that uh, there there's any lesser of a gender, but I think sometimes the realities in our society require that we consider um, ways of ensuring that actually women are in the mainstream. So these are things that corporate entities can be able to do and even governments can be able to do and we can push for this uh, deliberately. Uh, secondly, um, we've seen also corporates uh, support uh, a range of issues even with um, ranging from e-waste, environmental sustainability, and the likes. So we just need to raise and amplify our voices. The other thing, I go back to my point on um, community-centered design. Uh, the different genders um, operate differently in the community. Sometimes I believe uh, women are left out uh, because of the kind of responsibilities that they have to undertake. And we need to bring technology closer to them. We need to make it more accessible to them. And um, being uh, someone who is running an infrastructure company, uh, I have seen and um, I mentioned out of experience uh, that um, women really utilize technology for the benefit of the wider community. And we have to be deliberate and intentional about bringing technology closer to them, never mind uh, considerations uh, such as whether they are return on investments and the likes. But just from a, an, a fact of ensuring inclusion and equity, we need technological solutions that are closer to where they are working from so that they can be, we can be able to leverage on their unique strengths uh, and also make sure they are part and parcel of the information society we are building. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a brief reaction before yes. we are running out of time and we need to summarize the conversation. Sure. Thank you. Um, just to respond to the last question, um, I think one of the things we can really do to improve access and meaningful access and safe access for women is actually you start at your home, right? And this is not to say that systemically there are no changes to be done, but while the systemic changes happen because they take time, mm -hmm. what is something we can do is become better at home. Because I know that for a fact in India that you know, girls get, uh, you know, young women get phone last in the ham family, whereas boys can get phone at like 13 years, right? Um, girls use 
and young women's use, especially unmarried women's uh, use of mobile phones are heavily monitored by the men in the family. After marriage, it's monitored by the husband, right? And these are some things which we need to challenge at an individual and family level to start with. Um, if you really want to address online gender-based violence, one of the first things we need to do is that when women come and tell you that, hey, this happened to me on, on the internet and I'm bothered by it, we believe them and we don't m m you know, say that, oh, it's just on the internet, why are you so bothered by it, right? And I think these are some things that you start by. And mm -hmm. when advocating with the government, you know, um, they, they think that people who talk about gender are very soft and only talk about feelings, but it's not just that. Um, by leaving out women, you actually use billions of dollars in GDP, right? And we need to do research to find out how much is each country actually losing. Internet shutdowns cost, I think in, in uh, 2020, it cost like $126 billion for the countries where internet shutdowns took place, right? Um, when women are not present in digital spaces, you literally use lose like a trillion dollars um, in a year across countries. So if money is what we need to use to motivate people to care about gender and about women online, we use that, which means that we need to do research and find out how much is it, what is actually happening. I think these are some ways in which mm -hmm. we can address it. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I want to ask my colleague Paula Martins, who is the global policy lead in, a, in APC, to just share a view of what we have heard here in the perspective of contributing to the Global Digital Compact. As you know, this session has the motivation of uh, compiling inputs for this process in terms of um, determining what's the digital future that we want. So, Paula, please, for you to close the session. Thanks so much, Valeria. And uh, I'll just uh, build on what you just said, because I tried to create a, here a list, and it was it's really a summary. I have more notes, but I'll try to really highlight the main points. Um, and they are policy focused because we are looking at the Global Digital Compact as this opportunity to try to address all these issues. But I really wanted to start by saying that policy solutions are just a small piece and cannot stand alone. So we talked a lot also about capacity building, about movement building, um, and what we need to do now is to see how all of that relates to these policy issues that I'm going to, to highlight right now. Um, so I think we had both issues concerning process and content. So I'll start with process and clearly like the main issue here is inclusion and really discussing what is the procedure and who's in the room, what we mean by inclusion and how we operationalize that. Um, so we discussed um, exclusion factors like language, disability, um, visa, <laughs> I like the visa, the format and um, how you define um, gender and really the um, importance of not working with a binary approach to, den to gender. Then moving to the more substantive discussions, um, these are substantive discussions as well, so bear with me. No? But, but looking at gender and, and, and environmental as um, substantive issues, the first thing that was raised um, was that really we still don't have a good map of all the harm that the tech sector or all the intersections between technology and, uh, and the environment. So we need that and we need to look at the whole value chain um, from the production and the extraction of the things that you need to produce, then the production itself, the use and the disposal of the devices. So if we don't look at all of that, we don't have this clear idea of the harm. But then, as Juan Carlos was saying, the issue that we have already um, observed, <laughs> confirmed, is that uh, most of the cost for all these harms is being um, um, trans. Uh, uh, Transferred, thank you. Transferred really um, to the the global south of how he referred the rest of the world, and so the cost really is located of all this environmental harm, um, and yet there's still a discussion, an idea that um, the use of technology can reduce carbon emission, but we need really more information to even um, question that and, and 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 have evidence if that is really the case, and if not, like what is exactly going on. Then um, there was a, 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 an important part of the discussion that focused on uh, the, the the importance of communities. So, 
it's about inclusion, uh, but also about a better way of developing policies and developing technical solutions. So, uh, but I've talked a lot about community-led uh, solutions, also community-centered design, um, and, and how digital literacy is, is key in, in this aspect um, so that we can um, build um, the the, the solutions um, and, and then replicate the solutions that are created really from the needs of the community. And this is a strategy actually to work on the two main issues, environmental and gender. So it's kind of like a, the strategy for working on these issues, how you can better address these issues is really at the community level. But then looking more specifically at other gender um, key concerns that were, were raised. Um, the two main ones were clearly um, online gender-based violence and gender gaps in relation especially to digital inclusion, but more expensive. Um, in a more expanded way. Um, and then we talked a little bit about regulatory frameworks and how uh, enabling regulatory frameworks are important, uh, financing options, affordability, the role of open technology and open solutions more broadly, like open licensing uh, schemes. Um, and finally, and related to what I was telling you before, connecting to um, like uh, how policy and movement building get together, uh, there was this suggestion of investing more in communities of practice. And at the end, now during the questions, we discussed a little bit about platform accountability. And I think platform accountability has to do with regulatory frameworks. So um, it's building on that. So in a nutshell, um, and if you have any other points or if you want to know more, contri contribute more to this process uh, of uh, brainstorming for the Global Digital Compact, come talk to us at the end of the session. Thank you, Paula, and everyone. This effort expands what we have been doing in terms of collecting input for the Global Digital Compact. So we intend to use the conversation in this session to put a written contribution to the Global Digital Compact and also uh, watch for the other opportunities to engage with the, with the process. Uh, and uh, we will be also happy to share some news in relation to what is coming about um, our own contribution and other opportunities to keep engaging in conversations towards um, um, imagining together a digital future. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming to the session and hope to see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.